was looking for your brain. He was just Okay. Uh, well, I think we just lost the one person who's in here, so. Okay. okay. Well, maybe we'll just, we'll just stand and pray and get started, and then if he comes in, we'll, we'll turn and take his blessing. So this, this session's focus is um, how to begin to approach the reading of the church fathers for all ages. And so really the, the focus here, it'll be the same with the math, is um, you know, how, how in a, not just a homeschooling environment, but, just, but, but within a homeschooling environment in particular, but also you know, just as a family, how can you engage and, and, and read um, the church fathers? And so just by way of context, because a lot of times I feel like when we start to move into pedagogical conversations, that we lose the broader kind of Christian idea structure for Orthodox education, which is, again, if we understand education as formation of the child, right, with a purpose or aim of, you know, God willing, uh, inheriting the kingdom of God, which means our labors continue as parents, you know, up until the final days of the last judgment, so to speak, um, that we have to contextualize it. So if we're talking about education as Christian paideia or formation of the child, the very heart or center of that formation begins when the couple is married sacramentally in the church. Right? And we're given a clear image of, of, of what that means, right? which is that the gospel is at the center and that the couple is going to follow the, the cross of Christ for the, the entirety of their marriage, right? And that the crowns are placed on their heads as affirmations of their, their struggle up to that point in their life for purity. The fact that a, a new kingdom, a new center of the, of, of the cosmos is established, a new kingdom is being established uh, within, um, within the church, within that home, and that it's a life of martyrdom to to, to pursue that. And so when the blessing of the child comes, right, that all that preparation of ascetical, sacramental, liturgical life is, is in place to begin to nurture that child. And so if we're looking at the, the breadth of the church fathers across the centuries, there's three aspects of the, the, the core of formation of the child that's consistent across the church fathers in every century. And that's number one, that the parents live the life. Number two, that they pray for their children fervently, and that number three, that they actively engage the liturgical sacramental life of the church with their children. So that's the heart of Christian paideia, so, or formation of the child. So as we move into talking about pedagogy, I think it's especially in, in kind of Western American, uh, Western and specifically American, we begin to detach and say, well, okay, now I need to be like the perfect pedagogue, or I have to have my, my, my instructional practice perfect in order for my children to turn out well. So I'm trying to contextualize this to say, I think what we have to say is, of course, when we are instructing our children, we want to be able to instruct them as well as we can, right? And we're always striving for excellence in our instruction and the way that we go about it. But the idea that anybody arrives at kind of is like the perfect teacher or the perfect pedagogue or the perfect instructor, that just doesn't exist. Um, and so what we're trying to do today is just talk about, okay, as, we, as we, we instruct the children and look at pedagogically how to, to, to do things, hopefully, as best we can, what are some ways we can engage with the church fathers? So we're going to look in particular at um, uh, engaging the church fathers through the lives of the saints, through liturgical text, and then through actual like, church father texts themselves, okay, and, and, and we're going to try to do this rather than me talking to you about how to do it, which that means there's actually an engagement here. Um, are, we, are we all ready for that? Okay. Okay, good. So, um, just a few notes on studying the Church Fathers, so that I just note down before we get started. Number one, you don't have to have an advanced degree in patristics to read and study the Church Fathers. 
Um, there, it, it is, there is a place for those people in the church who have those degrees, but to engage the church fathers in meaningful ways does not obviously require um, uh, we're driving spiritual benefit. That being said, in order to engage the church fathers, we do need to have a good understanding of our faith, right? Because we're trying to enter into a conversation with them. And so, for example, the more we can understand and know our faith, the richer the texts become for us, right? But that's not that's not an academic uh, endeavor, right? That's an ascetical endeavor of us growing. Not just in our hearts, but also in our minds and our understanding of our faith and gaining better understanding. So, so that is that is a, a part that we should strive towards. Um, number two, the church fathers did not live back then. This is really important. Orthodox Christianity, the church fathers are the saints, and in particular, the greater def- great defenders and teachers of the faith. As such, we should think of the church fathers as contemporary companions who are walking with us today within the unity of the church. We can ask for their intercessions and they're mystically present with us within the life of the church and the services. Right? So it's not, so when we're dealing with reading the church, well, let's say we're reading St. Basil the Great or St. John Chrysostom, yes, we're, we are reading in a text that's old, but, but our relationship with St. John is not one of, you know, a person who's dead who we're reading their text, right? We're actively with them and they're with us. And this is important, especially when we're engaging the text. Um, so, when we approach the church fathers, it's important to strive to approach the stories, their lives, the text with humility. Right, so, the virtue of humility is important when we're reading the text um, in order to be able to understand that it is an ascetical uh, discipline. Reading the text isn't just an intellectual uh, process, but it's an ascetical one. So we go into it with prayer, we enter it with humility, and we're there actively engaging um, in the same way we should in any way just approach the scripture. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is a narration. So how many of us do narrations in our home? Okay, so you know. A wonderful way to engage, and so the lives of the saints are fantastic. Just thought I'd point out a few ideas, like when you're dealing with narration in the saints, um, some of the aspects that are particularly beneficial with narration. So one is the child begins to familiarize uh, himself with the lives of the saints and the liturgical calendar, right? So, so out of this narration, it can go in a ton of different directions in terms of what can be, can be useful. Um, you can find the life of the saint in the Synoxarian after you read maybe a shorter life of the saint. Um, you can look at the church calendar. Um, key to narration is that the children learn how to ask good questions. Right? That's a huge part of narration, is the ability for the kids to be able to ask meaningful, good questions. Um, of course, narration strengthens the child's memory. I think it's a proven old, ancient technique, right? Um, it's also a wonderful place to jump into studying history. So we're going to do St. Nina of Georgia, um, the narration there. Um, and so out of the meaningful questions will become a lot of historical questions. Like they might ask, I never knew there was an Orthodox saint in Georgia. And you're like, oh, we're thinking about the state of Georgia, right? So then, you know, so just, you know, these types of things, or where did she live, or when we'll get into that. Um, of course, you can always go read the services of the saints, which is another wonderful kind of jumping off point to move into another liturgical space that we'll look at. Um, and then of course, you're the whole time kind of the theology of the church is working there that you can engage. So we'll, we'll see how much, there's different ways to do narrations, right? So especially being on the range of the age of your children, if you have more mature children, then, you know, we can do the narration and they can, someone can stand up and try and recite the whole thing back to you. And I'd say the biggest mistake with narration is that people do summaries of what they heard, right? And you're trying to do a literal dictation word for word of exactly what you've heard. Um, if you have, you know, younger children, and it could, you know, um, you can either modify the text, but for the older kids, it, it may be less interesting, so you can go with a little bit more complete text, but then you can do, uh, you know, kind of like a baton process where, you know, you let the little ones go first and they say a few things, right, and then, you know, and then you can move to the older ones who can then start to fill in the, the details with the gaps, etc. Um, but it's definitely something you can do with the whole, and we have seven children, and, you know, you can do it with 
everybody at once, right? Um, and and it's, a, it's a nice space. So I'm going to read the narration to you, and then someone's going to volunteer to narrate it back. Or maybe I'll just pick someone. No. <laughs> Would it pick you? All right. St. Nina of Georgia. The Holy Virgin Nina was from Cappadocia. According to some, her father, Zebulon, was a friend of the holy great martyr George, whose father was a Cappadocian. The conversion of Georgia by Nina is reported in the church histories of Rufinus, Socrates, Sozomen, and Theodoret. Rufinus, writing less than a hundred years after Nina, said that he heard the history in Jerusalem from a Georgian prince named Bacurius. Nina was taken captive by the Georgians and while in captivity, she lived a very devout life of sobriety and virtue. Praying unceasingly night and day, this drew the attention of the Georgians. And to all who asked her about her way of life, she preached the dispensation of Christ. When she healed, was healed by a certain woman's sick, excuse me, when she healed by her prayer a certain woman's sick child, whom no one else had been able to help, the report of her came to the ears of Queen, the Queen of Georgia, who was herself gravely afflicted with an incurable malady. She asked that the captive women be brought to her, but Nina declined out of modesty. So the queen commanded them to carry her to Nina. Nina healed her immediately using her cross of vines, and the queen returned home in joy. When she extolled Nina and her faith to the king, he gave her no heed, although she mentioned it to him often. But while hunting in the forest, he was shrouded with an impenetrable darkness, and when she lost his way, became separated from his men and fell into despair. He made a vow that if Christ should deliver him, he would worship him alone. The light of day straightway shone again, and the king fulfilled his vow. He and the queen were instructed in the faith by Nina, and they with the whole Georgian nation became Christians. The king also sent an embassy to Constantine the Great, informing him of their conversion and requesting that priests be sent to Georgia. Nina reposed in peace in about the year 335. So I'm going to start us. We'll, we'll do a baton structure. Does so anyone get started for us? Yes. Good. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. And usually we'll have our kids stand, right? For a bit of class, we'll have them stand. But we won't necessarily stand. Do you want to pick it up or just give us something you remember? I mean, when I, when, I mean, like even when I do this in my school, I'll, I'll have kids probably give me 70% of the story <laughs> verbatim. <laughs> yes? Any other details on the king's conversion? Anyone want to add? He was enveloped in darkness. Yes. And he worshipped him alone. That's right. What did she do while she was in Georgia? She prayed ceaselessly. Good. Any details of the end that might be of importance? Um, 
okay, so the whole nation was converted. What other details? What's that? So he sent to the emperor Constantine to send priests. Right? Okay, so we've done a good job. So good job. So the next thing in the narration is you. What kind of questions emerge out of this narration for you? For you. So can we can we put some meaningful questions on the table? In other words. What did the Georgians believe before they were converted to Christianity? Because it sounds like, does he believe that there are other gods? Right. And, the, and the answer is yes, but he's not going to worship one of them. Right? And of course, then he'll, in, 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 those, in those stories, a lot of times you find out that you know, they had their own set of gods, but then they find out that those gods weren't, they were, they were gods, but they were lowercase gods. demons or something like this, right? Okay, so what, what was the Georgian religion beforehand? Good question. What else? Yeah, so, so who were these, so they mentioned a number of historians like the Phoenix, right? So who are these historians that pre preserved this story? What else? Yeah, so, so, yeah, how is, another way to ask that question is how, how, how can we trust the authority of the transmission of the story, right? Which is a very kind of question that the kids will want to ask, like, why should I trust this story? I don't want authority. What other questions emerge? Are there any miracles in seeing the day where the accounts for are written down throughout the ages since then? Yeah, so, yeah, that's a wonderful question. How does, how does St. Peter move forward in history as, as a saint? What other questions? Yeah. So, so yeah. So, what is yeah? So, there's a whole history of Georgia now to to to, to begin to unpack. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. So, how is this king having communication with Saint Constantine, and how does the Roman imperial structure of uh, Byzantium how is it interacting with with the Georgian lands up to that point? And how did Saint Constantine? What would it take? Exactly, do we have any record of response or correspondence between them? Right. What are the questions might emerge? Mm -hmm. Yeah, why, why did they capture her to begin with? Because you have her actually being captured, and you actually have some petitioning St. Constantine to <laughs> send, send clergy up uh, in order to. Okay, so, so what are some observations? And right, so when I use the term observation, I, I mean, what I mean by that is not something you saw, but something that you're bringing as a human agent that contributes meaningfully in relationship to the text. Right, so I'll give you an example. So one observation I have was, we seem to learn something about the nature of missionary efforts in the church through the story. How is missionary effort done? So what else might we know? What's that? Yeah, so, so what, is, what is the role of miracles in the church, and how do they impact and shape and form people and even convert people? Yep. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, so we can, yeah. So I think there's a little... Yeah, as I was gonna say, I think there's a whole exploration here of the missionary, right? And then you can say, well, what other type of missionary efforts can we think about? Well, then you may, you know, then you could talk about, you know, Kievit Roots, right? And you could talk about Alaska with St. Herman. And you can say, well, are there are parallels between what's actually happening in these spaces, you know? Are they going with the intention of, like, changing and fixing people, right? Or are they going and setting up places of prayer and establishing sacred spaces and, you know, so when does, if you, no one caught this, stated this detail, but when does it say that Sagina talked to anyone about the faith? I'll pick up on that. It said, so it says, 
Nina was, a, Nina was a captive by the Georgians while in captivity. She lived a very devout life of sobriety and virtue, praying unceasingly night and day. This drew attention to, of the Georgians, and to all who asked her about her way of life, she preached the dispensation of Christ. Right, so that detail tells us something, right? Was she going out teaching and preaching? No, it was when she lived her life and then when people did what? They asked her, and then she, she preached to them. Now, this is something that seems to gloss past people, but what else is really significant about the fact that St. Nina is doing this? What's that? She's a woman, right? You know, and so, like, in, in the courses, I actually, when we do the patristic courses, we teach in our, our you know, um, school, you know, we read different, you know, St. Sophia, Faith, Hope, and Love, St. Claire, to be, like, you know, all these, you know, and her title itself is what? Equal to the apostles. So what does this mean? Right, so now you're actually into kind of a conversation of anthropology about what does it mean to be a human and how is what's happening here in the church. Um, other observations from the text. Any thoughts on the king's conversion? Anything we see parallels here? Constantine. Okay, what's that? I say parallel to Constantine. Okay, how so? Yeah, they're both what? They're both bargaining. kings or emperors, right? Yeah. And they're both bargaining. And what happens when they convert? The whole nation converts. So why is that happening? Right? Are they like forcing everyone down? Or is it the idea that the kingdom's ruler is changing? Right? The gods are changing. And so there's an enthronement of a new god. And so all the people are now submitting to the new god. Right? So they're back to that cosmological structure and being able to connect there. What else happens in his conversion that's significant that probably would draw parallels? That's a really good one. And of course, you could go through a whole trajectory, like with Kevin Roos and Prince Vladimir. Yeah, so the parallel with St. Paul's conversion, because he enters into what? The darkness, right? And so he's entering into this divine darkness, right? And so again, if the kids are older, that's a whole space that you could really begin to, to, to go much deeper into with them. What is the divine darkness in the church, right? Why? Why is this a space that we enter into? And why is it in that divine darkness, like St. Dionysius says, you know, it, it's deeper than the light, right? So what's happening in, in that space? So it's a very rich kind of deep theological question about what's happening with St. Paul, now what's happening with the king of Georgia, you know, etc. And who catechizes the king and queen? St. Dionysius. She's catechizing the king and queen. But then why, then the question is, why do they need to call for the clergy? Yeah, they, had, they were going to serve the God, and what did the people need to have happen to them? They had all to be baptized, right? She can't, she's not going to baptize them, right? She's equal to the apostles, but the clergy have to do the, the baptism, right? Um, any other thoughts or observations? could say things like, you could omit the date and say, what, when do you think this happened, right? And to see if this, the, the children can begin to connect, you know, well, we've got St. Constantine here, you know, the kind of the historical con context of what's happening and see if they can come to two other. So how long do you think you could spend on this narration? What's that? Right, you could spend like 15 or 20 minutes if you wanted to, or you could build an entire, let's say, type of unit, right? I mean, you could spend weeks, you know, working through the different, okay, we're going to look at, you know, missionary efforts in the church, you know, off of St. Nina. Now we're going to look at, you know, um, the scriptural relationship between what we see here. So anyway, so it's a very, um, very rich space. And I think, you know, even study shows, um, you know, the narration, the kids remember the, the, the information and the stories much longer than if they take notes or do mind maps or things like that. I mean, they have actually done studies on these things, but I don't think they needed studies to tell us. Um, so, you know, finding, you know, whether, I mean, all the churches now, their websites have pretty brief lives of saints, you know, so they're very accessible. Liturgical texts are much more accessible now. Um, so, again, I think they're a, a beautiful way to, whether you're going to do like 15, 20 minutes once a week with them, it's an evening thing that you do as a family, whether, you know, mom or dad leads the, the narration together or whatever. 
but then you can also see that there's a whole world of exploration that goes in a lot of different directions um, for the for the for the children. And and, and in that point, you are, you know, if you're going to talk about studying the church fathers, that's that's what you're doing at that point, right? In other words, you're, you know, the church fathers and their students all the saints from um, then to now. So, any questions about? We're just kind of going to you know, walk through some of these in different ways. And just, so, if anyone else has, I mean, it's not that is it. I mean, I know some of you do narration, so if you if you want to share or contribute, please do. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So so we do the narration again, depending on the complexity of the story and what children and you know all these things, and then you can move to we we move to meaningful questions, right? And then observations, right? And, and really wonderful to begin to come up with, you know, you know, and if a question is not, let's say it's not a good question, we don't say it's a bad question, right? You say, well, do you think you could improve that question? Or could you say it differently, you know, to give them a clue that maybe there's a, there's a, more, a, a better way to say that and then be very careful that other kids aren't like, you know, blowing down someone or something like that in the process. Um, okay, I'm going to give you the, the handouts because we're going to look at the text. Um, next, we're going to look at uh, liturgical hymns, um, which can, can be a, a wonderful way to engage as well the writing of the Church Fathers because our hymns all come from who? They all come from the Church Fathers, right? All our hymns are written by, by saints. Um, so... Some benefits of studying a hymn is it makes the children more attentive to the services because you can contextualize this hymn. Um, you can study the structure of the services in the liturgical cycle, right, in, for the context of the hymn. Um, the hymns are replete with scriptural references, so it's an opportunity to extend yourself into the scripture with the children. Um, if you know the saint who wrote the hymn, which some of them we do, then you can obviously, like St. John of Damascus wrote, many things for us, so you can then go study the, the saints themselves who wrote the hymn. Um, obviously, the theology of the church is embedded in our hymnology. The hymns of our church are poetic. They're poems, fundamentally. And so you're also studying, if you will, poetry uh, in the process. Um, you can learn to chant the hymn, right? So the, child, the children can actually learn to chant the hymn as well, and then that's a type of, of memorization as well um, of course asking good questions and then if you're into language you could go grab it in another language like Greek or something like that and if, or, or if you're doing language study at all right and you can begin to put those things uh, together as well and usually even if it's just going sometimes just looking at it you can just pick out a few words and that can be just very nice for the, for the kids as well it doesn't mean they can do a deep linguistic study of the whole hymn. So, but I will say this, approaching a hymn or a text, which, you know, as we, as we go through this, I, there, there are different ways to frame engaging text. So I'm just going to give you one that I think is, is kind of tried and true. Uh, but you, you don't want to, I don't think you generally want to engage the text the way you do the narration. Right? The narration, you can just read it, they can say it back to you, you can ask meaningful questions, do observations, etc., and then, and then go where how do you organize yourself for the day or, or, or for the week? But with text, I do think there's a, there's a, you need to provide more framework for them. So there's kind of three ways, um, three, three kind of setups that I think are important. Number one is it's good to have at least one normative question going into the text. So for example, this text, I might say something like a normative question might be, um, what is the nature of virtue? Um, and then oftentimes, too, depending on how complex or long the text is or hymn is, you might also want to have prepared a couple of guiding questions, right? And so guiding questions is, are, are things that you're not asking them to, like, answer the question, but it's orientating them to know kind of what to look for. Because a lot of times students are in, uh, like, kids will, will read something, but if they're not oriented to kind of focus somewhere, they'll just miss everything, right? So, for example... You could say something like, a few guiding questions to think about is, what is the relationship between the body and the soul in this hymn? Well, which is an anthropological question, right? What it means to be a human. Or you could say, um, <clears throat> what is, 
how, how is fasting spoken of? Or, um, you, know, you know, let's see, another one that might be good is, uh, what's the relationship between uh, repentance and, and Pascha? So let's just read the hymn. Um, we're probably all very familiar with this particular hymn. It's chanted at Forgiveness Vespers on Sunday evening going into the great fast. So let us set out with joy upon the season of the fast and prepare ourselves for spiritual combat. Let us purify our soul and cleanse our flesh. As we fast from food, let us abstain also from every passion. Rejoicing in the virtues of the Spirit, may we persevere with love and so be counted worthy to see the solemn passion of Christ our God and with great spiritual gladness be to behold his holy Passover. So if we were to start with our normative question, okay, um, what is virtue? With the normative questions, I think what you, it, it's often helpful to do is that the, the kids need to make a commitment before they read the text. So you might have your kids write down, what is virtue? Right? So, so that what's happening is they're not becoming passive in the engagement. They're actually making a commitment at some level. I think virtue is this, right? So that when they engage the text, they themselves are having the conversation with the text. They're not just looking at you to, to begin to tell you, tell them what, what virtue is. Right? So it's sort of saying in your mind, ask yourself, what is the nature of virtue or what is virtue? And then once we've read it, we say, okay, having read the text, what do you think the author, don't say what the text is saying because text can't talk to you. What is the author of the text communicating about virtue? So what do we think? some kind of struggle. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the virtue seems to require purification. So there's some relationship between purification and virtue. Okay, so now we have this relationship between struggle, purification, and the Holy Spirit. So we're kind of building context here where clearly we're going to have to start to figure out how that all begins to fit together. Right? Why? Okay. Love. So, so if we're going to sustain virtue, what has to be present? So now we have another longitudinal di dimension of virtue, which seems like if you're going to sustain whatever it is that you've acquired, you're going to have to have love. What else? Yeah, so, and again, here, the, this is from the Bishop Closest Aware, which is a pretty standard translation for Passover, but you might note to them that that word Passover could also be what? Pascha, right? So, so there is a reward here, which is that at Pascha, you get to actually behold what? <laughs> yeah, his, his, the, the spiritual blindness and his holy resurrection. Right. So what, what's contained within this struggle according to the text? What's it is, what's a symptom? that? Okay, the joy. What, so yeah, so let's talk about that. So where, what are you joyful about? What's that? The season of fasting, right? So the, you know, you have this, this image of we're setting out on a struggle that's going to be very difficult and very long, and our attitude toward it is that we're filled with what? Joy. And then at the end, when we receive our reward, we're filled with what? Spiritual gladness, or, or we can say joy. Right. So we can see there's a parallelism within this hymn of structure. Right. <clears throat> How do we fast? Right. If this is if this is central to this this text to this hymn, the struggle is in the season of the fast. How do we fast according to the text? Okay. Yeah. We, with joy, and it, it's tied to food. Right, but it's also tied to what? What's that? To, yeah, to abstaining from our passions and our sins. So the question becomes, okay, what is the relationship between food, fasting, and sin? Right? And 
there's a whole conversation there about, for us as Orthodox Christians, the unity of the body and the soul, right, that, that can, can occur with the kids, that we're one human, and that it's not like, it's not a, I mean, we use this as a language with them, but you know, it's not a dualism where there's like the body and then there's the, the soul, but they're deeply interconnected, right? And so, you know, you go have a huge steak dinner, you're probably not really looking forward to a good, you know, three hour vigil at church, you know, and so how do foods affect your desires and your passions? And then at the heart of the fasting is the cultivation of self control, right? That if I can say no to food, then I might be able to say no to what? To sin. Um, so again, just as we kind of look at this, this particular hymn, you know, it's, it's rich with, with all sorts of conversation pieces, right, that aren't just like studying about the church, right, it's studying about what it means to be a human, how do we flourish, right, going back to the normative structures for us, this is, this isn't just like normal for us, like in our church, so this is the way life is, you know. And of course, you can talk about the opposite of fasting as being what? Gluttonous, right? And gluttony induces the passions, and depending on the age of the kids, you can get into, you know, the types of passions that are tied to gluttony, and you can, you know, potentially find there's a part of fathers that extrapolate those connections or whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, so when you're trying to put together the ascetical dimension, the purification, and the acquisition of the Holy Spirit as a temple of God, it begins to help the kids begin to understand and see the life of the church, but also the life of the church in relationship to the liturgical life, um, which is very important. Uh, because then when they come to church, you know, of course there's a whole conversation depending on when you're doing this. If you're doing it entering the great fast, then you've got a whole conversation there about when you go to church, this is going to be one of the hymns, and you know, follow that, and you go and pass out of paradise, etc. So, um, any comments or thoughts on the text? On that? So how long could you spend on this text? Right. Again, you could spend 30 minutes on it. It could be wonderful. Or you could spend, you know, quite a bit of time because you could say, well, let's go look at, you know, what the scripture says about fasting. Does the Lord talk about fasting? The Lord doesn't just talk about fasting. He actually does talk. He gives a commandment that you fast, you know. As our Christian teacher was going to say, this is a if you fast. <laughs> <laughs> it says when you fast, right? Um, so, so any other thoughts on this text? Yes. I just have a question. Yeah. So, are you proposing that, like, if you were going to do the same for your after dinner study or something, yeah. you read it orally? But maybe with the hymn, it's something they've been hearing in church, so then yeah. everyone is looking, if they're old enough, they're all looking at it. Yeah, so yeah, so yeah, that's the general structure I'm trying to make. So, I didn't give you all the, the original text, so you just read the narration with it. Right. Yeah, so the narration, I think, pedagogically is a different engagement than, than a text. Okay. And with text, I do think is, you know, it doesn't have to be complex, right? You can just say, okay, well, we're going to, you know, you don't have to use the normative question. You can just say, the question we're going to think about and reflect on tonight is, what is virtue? So I just want you in 10 seconds to write down something, right? Or it could be, I want you to write a page essay on the nature of virtue on one day, you know, and then the next day you you read the text, right? So again, I'm trying to kind of just provide like a framework that could be developed, you know, or it could be a whole research paper, right? We'll go read St. John the Ladder and look in the index at the back where he says virtue. And I want you to go through everywhere he talks about virtue and how does that compare with this particular hymn? You know, um, or go read Aristotle, uh, maybe a little, bit, a little bit more complex. Go read Aristotle and see what he says about virtue. And, you know, or why does, Aristotle leave humility out of his list of virtues, and why is it the central part of the Christian life? You know, so again, it can scale into comparative, you know, ancient philosophy, or how do people consider think about virtue today? Well, we generally think of it as a rational process of, of, of habit and behavior, right? So you see all these things like, change your habits in 30 days, you know? So it's very psychological uh, in the process. So. Okay, so, the next we're going to look at is just a t text or saying. So I kind of just differentiate those a little bit. Um, and again, I think the, the the benefits of reading the text, and again, you could read longer text. I mean, for our purposes, I kept them very short. And, and for, for many people, shorter text may be a very, very nice thing because it's much more manageable unless uh, if you're dealing with the whole. And right now, the focus of this talk is for the whole family. Right? And so 
trying to like, okay, so I've got my six-year-old daughter there, and I've got my 16-year-old son there. Let's say, how do I, how can I bring this together, right? And again, at that point, you could spend a lot of different kind of uh, assignment journeys, depending on how old they are or how you would you know, prefer to do that. Um, but again, with when you're reading a text or saying, I think we can talk about uh, the same way as applying to a hymn, um, although the difference here is it's, it doesn't happen in a liturgical context. But the context would be important for, to have just a little bit of history context and know what's going on there. So I would say, for example, the next one is a saying from the Desert Fathers, and so I think a good normative question is, what is the nature of justice? What is the nature of justice? And if you, if you have children, justice is always a big question, right? Because and it's usually when justice hasn't been served for them, right? <laughs> and we're no different than adults, probably, so it's okay. Um, so we're going to read this first little uh, story saying from the Desert Fathers, or story, and we're going to reflect on the normative question of what is the nature of justice. Once a brother had been caught in a particular sin, and the abbot of the monastery asked St. Moses to come to the church and join the group council in order to agree upon a punishment for the monk's sin. He reluctantly came to the council, carrying on his back a, a leaking bag of sand. When he arrived, the brother asked him why he was carrying that leaking sandbag. He simply said, the sand is my sins which are trailing out behind me while I go to judge the sins of another. At such a reply, the brothers forgave the offender and returned to focusing on their own salvation rather than the sins of their brother. This is a good one to deploy when that type of justice has occurred in the home. Not do it preempted ahead of time so you can always... <laughs> Reference back. So if, if, if we're reading that story, and the question is, what is what is justice? So how is justice represented here? Okay, so it seems that they're going to give a punishment for 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 the sin. Okay. So how is how is the just the question of justice resolved in the text? Forgiveness. What's that? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. And how is that forgiveness off enacted? Yeah, there's a turn to the interior of the, of the person to see their own sins, and in looking to the interior of their own sins, they're compelled to do what? To forgive the other because they're just as unworthy and a sinner as the other. Right. So where could you go with this text? What could you do? What, how can you kind of take that further? What's that? Yeah, so you can talk about the virtue of humility, right? You could talk about what does the bag of sand on his back represent? The sins that he can't see, right? So again, not putting your kids through some kind of intense you know, internal inspection, but, but, you know, what does it mean to have a bag of sand on your back? And why is it on his back and not on his chest? Right. Yeah, so you can go to liturgical prayers we have in the church, like the prayer of St. Ephraim, and say, okay, look, you know, we actually pray this in the church. Um, I was also talking about Christ's voluntary suffering, right, on behalf of, um, of others. What else could we do with this? How could you make it a writing exercise? Yes. I think I think if you want to do like I mean I, I personally if I'm doing it with like my, my family kids I might like if you want to have a journal exercise where they could they could do that individually I'd probably be hesitant to out of concern that maybe some others might help others. <laughs> like when the priest says, you know, to the husband, thank you for confessing for your wife, I'll give her absolutely, you know. <laughs> you know, so try to avoid those. But I think, yeah, a lot, again, the extensions out of it of like journal reflection or whatever it may be um, could be very, very useful. Um, you could ask them to, to, for example, write the story, but write the story in the 21st century. Right, to, to, to help them, you know, resituate the story, but to maintain the same story structure. So that since they're doing an imitation, 
right? It's a loose type of imitation because they're not, co but they're maintaining form, but maybe they're, they're not going to maybe do like exact word for word textual kind of structural imitation. Um, but that can also be very helpful to them because then it's forcing them to begin to want to contextualize the story uh, in a way that's different from thinking of it just as like these desert fathers, you know? You can, you can obviously get into the history of the desert fathers, right? You could pull up the maps of the Nile in, in Egypt and show where they went and talk about why they were there, who they were. In this case, it's St. Moses. So you could get the icon of him, you could read his life, you could you know, extrapolate out that way um, as well. Another thing I think you can do is you could say, well, how do people think of justice today? How was justice conceived of in the Old Testament? And how is Christ's justice different from the justice of the Old Testament or the social activism of justice that we see today where the focus is on fixing people? That's unjust, so I'm going to fix you. As opposed to turning to the interior and, and being merciful. Right? And how that connects with who Christ is and how he exacts justice against us, so to speak, is just simply by going and dying for us um, and then rising from the dead. Uh, so I think there's a, there is, depending on the age of the kids, there's a very deep reflective point there, like in a, in a story like this, on the nature of justice. And how, as Orthodox Christians, we approach justice, um, and how that's quite, quite different from how, let's say, culturally, we conceive of of justice. And then, you know, again, I wouldn't press it into the personal home space, you know, um, but it's something that if, I think if it's nurtured at home, the, and, and we live it as parents towards each other first and foremost, and then by extension to our children, that they'll learn let's say, to exact justice the way our Lord does and the way St. Moses does. Um, there's a second one here. You know, a monk came to Abbas Sazoes and said, what shall I do, Father, for I have fallen from grace? And he replied, get up again. The monk came back shortly after and said, what shall I do now, for I have fallen again? And the old man said to him, just get up again. Never cease getting back up again. So again, another very little one. It's a beautiful little story. The Desert Fathers have lots and lots of sayings. Um, and, uh, you know, they all they all bring us to a point of humility. So we won't necessarily uh, extrapolate on that one. Um, but any, any questions on just the sayings in the Desert Fathers or any thoughts or additions for kind of a pedag pedagog pedagogical engagement with it? Yes? Yeah, so again, I mean, you know, if, if you have... Um, and, and again, a lot of, I mean, we're, we're kind of scratching the surface, but you can imagine, you know, they can draw pictures, right? Especially if they're little children, draw a picture of what you're hearing, you know. Um, so if they're littler, you know, again, it's just kind of moving it back and forth. But, but the goal is to have, as a family, a meaningful conversation around what's, what's happening in that space. And again, you can move into writing pieces or artistic pieces or liturgical text or research or whatever it is in different ways, which I, I know all of you can, you, you can see that and you all know that. Um, but, um, but in the space itself that's being defined there, um, it's, it's to produce, you know, let's say for lack of better words, a community of learners that are engaging together and building each other up and their understandings. Okay, so the last one I picked is a, is a, is a text from a church father. His name is St. Pius the Athenite. So in this case, I've, I've moved to someone who's contemporary, and, and I think this is important with the kids so that they can actually sense the fact that the continuity between if you're reading, you know, St. John Chrysostom, and now we're reading St. Paisius, is the fact that we can say, look, these are all, you know, uh, patristics, right? We don't have some kind of cutoff where like it ends in the, the 800s or something like that, like it happens in the Western trajectory. Um, so this is by St. Pius the Athenite. God has permitted and does permit us to be shaken by adversity. Difficult times lie ahead. We will be greatly tested. We have to take this warning seriously and live spiritually. Many saints would have loved to have lived in our times and have had our chance to struggle for Christ. Our struggle matters because it is not a struggle against an Ali Pasha or a Hitler and a Mussolini, but a struggle against the devil himself. For this reason, our wages will be heavenly. The saints will become more holy and the vile will become more vile. And I feel great consolation inside. 
This is only a storm like past storms that will pass. May the good God take evil and turn it into good. Amen. Now, this is probably for a little bit older group, um, depending on your children. But I think it, but you can see that there's a real difference and shift in reading this text versus reading something then, right? Because now he's clearly engaging us. Um, but if you've done a series of these and you're moving historically, they'll also say, well, he's saying the same and so you're showing the continuity historically to the, to the kids in the ethos of the church, which is extremely important. Um, and in this case, I think there's, there's an element of challenge and difficulty, but there's also a clear, clear image of hope. And, and to me, the most pressing line in this text to discuss is, many saints would have loved to have lived in our times, right? And I think that is, that's a very important aspect of this text to me to talk about why would a saint if our times are so difficult why would they want to live here you know and you know, it's because the opportunity to struggle for Christ's sake just becomes that much greater you know that's kind of what St. Pius is trying to, to get at um, but there's a lot of you know things going here here he deals with where is the real struggle it's an interior struggle again and it's against two. It's against the devil. It's not against Hitler or Mussolini, you know, etc. Right. So again, really helping. I think in, when in studying the church fathers, it's always that interior movement that's so important for them. We saw it with the Saint Moses text. We're seeing it here. We see it in the the hymn earlier. It just permeates the whole space. The notion of justice, the perseverance of love, and really helping them begin to understand. It talked about earlier the cosmology how is the creation renewed well it's renewed by god becoming man and that transformation occurs from the inside out right and in a world today where we're told constantly it happens from the outside and it never gets to the end because it's never my fault right it's always someone else's fault or some system's fault or some institution's fault um, you know helping them begin to understand the orthodox life what it, what it really is about. Um, and then at the end, that it's like a storm, it passes. You know, and, and, and it's something I think all of our kids, you know, from the contemporary saints need to hear, right? That these storms come and they go, but Christ doesn't. So um, we're kind of, we're, well, I don't know, I don't really know where we're at time wise, but, but I do know it was supposed to end at five, and we're at five or three. Um, so hopefully, you know, just kind of reflecting on the pedagogical aspects in relationship to the church father and looking at it from <clears throat> their narration perspective, the hymnological perspective, from the textual kind of saying perspective. And again, <clears throat> hopefully it's clear that you don't, you know, uh, you can take a very uh, short text for Life of the Saint, and I think you can do a lot with it, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean you're reading the whole corpus of St. John Chrysostom even a whole homily, which sometimes can be even very um, challenging um, for people. It's not to say that you should aim for that as the kids mature or something like that. Um, you know, and picking things they're familiar with, right? So like a great text is the Paschal homily by St. John Chrysostom, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's a text that's as alive as any text for them. Um, but it happens quickly, and it's the middle of the night. <laughs> so, you know, so being then able to had her afterwards, but also that text, for example, is brilliant rhetorically. So if you're wanting to study rhetoric, there may not be a better piece to read. And so one of the beautiful things about the Church Fathers is they're writing poetry. They're rhetorically brilliant um, in all these types of Even when it's translated into it's not in, you know, we're not reading the primary language, but still you're getting the effects of, of, of that, that, um, that genius that they possess too. So it really is a, a deeply formative space for them. So, well, thank you all. And also, just so you know, that quote I read earlier by Eliades is on the back side of that.